This chapter is an introduction to how our cells use energy, a little bit about ATP and an introduction to that, as well as a little bit about the role that enzymes play in cell reactions. So we're going to start with a definition of energy. So energy is the capacity to do work, and you've probably learned that there's potential energy, which is stored, and kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion. But there's some other terminology in this chapter that comes up, so I want you to be familiar with these words as far as forms of energy. So free energy is the energy that's available in your body right now to do work. Theoretically, if, you're, if you spontaneously combusted, your body has a whole lot of energy in it. But if you want to stay alive, you can't use all the energy in your body. Only some of it's actually available to do work. It's sort of like the amount of um, your net worth. You know, What do you have right now in your pocket money to spend? That would be sort of like the free energy, the money you have right now in your pocket that you could go into a store and buy something. Even though you may be wearing a watch that's worth a lot of money, if you can't use that to go buy something in Publix, then technically that wouldn't be free energy. It would be worth money, but it's not money you have available right now. So hopefully that kind of makes sense, but free energy is the energy your cells have that's right now ready to do some work for your cells. Chemical energy is the potential energy that's stored in the bonds of molecules. Whenever they give an example of kinetic um, potential energy, <clears throat> if you Google it, you're always going to see the same picture of a guy rolling a rock over a hill. And that the, the rock has potential energy because if once you get it started, it would release all its energy when it rolls down the hill. And that is a good definition of potential energy, but the problem is that doesn't really help you visualize how you have potential energy in your body, because you obviously don't have cells that are like rocks getting ready to roll down a hill. In your body, the potential energy, the stored energy, is in the bonds of the molecules. Glucose has energy in its bonds. When you break glucose into carbon dioxide and water, you release that energy that's trapped in the bonds. Fat stores energy. Where? It's in the bonds. When you break fat down into carbon dioxide and water, you release the energy that it's storing. Mechanical energy is the energy that you're using for movement, like your muscles, like endocytosis we just talked about, how your cells move. So when you're talking about mechanical energy, you're talking about, you know, think about gears turning. That's the energy. It is kinetic. It's kinetic energy. But it's the energy that your cells and your body is using for actual motion. And then heat or thermal energy. Um, for purposes of our cells, in the chemistry lab, sometimes you use heat as like an energy source to get a reaction going. That doesn't work in your cells. Heat is not a useful source of energy for work in living things. In your cells, heat is actually a waste product. It's sort of just floating off, and it's, it's random molecular motion. And although, yes, you know, our body heat keeps us warm, technically heat is a waste product form of energy, and you should know that. That's really important. This schematic really helps. So chemical energy, there's the energy that's stored in carbs, fats, proteins, etc. ATP is our energy currency. It's sort of going to capture that energy temporarily to do work in our cells. The chemicals, the matter, will turn into carbon dioxide and water. The energy from the chemicals will eventually become heat. And that's a waste product. Notice how they show it coming out of our cells. So. There are two laws of thermodynamics that you should know. The first one, I'm sure everybody's heard this before, is that energy can't be created or destroyed. The idea is that the total amount of the energy in the universe stays the same. And I have a little picture here. Energy before, energy after, there's the same amount of energy. That doesn't mean, though, that the energy stays the same form. That's the important part. The part about the energy being transformed, sometimes energy gets turned into a form, like heat, that's not useful to us anymore. So even though the amount of energy is the same, the quality of the energy doesn't stay the same. So that's why you have to keep eating, because energy is being not destroyed, but turned into a form that's not useful to you anymore. So you need to eat more food to extract the energy from that food in a useful form. Here's another schematic that kind of helps again. The sun provides energy for photosynthesis. Plants capture the sun's energy and trap it in the bonds of sugar. And then when the llama eats the plants, some of the energy is transferred to them. But notice that at every step along the way, some of that energy is being lost as heat. Again, not destroyed, but turned into a form that's not useful anymore. 
And so that brings us to our second law of thermodynamics, which basically says that every time there's an energy transformation, some of the energy becomes not useful or unusable. And that's the heat that we're talking about here. So even though energy is getting converted from one form to another, it's, it's getting converted to less and less useful forms until all of it is eventually heat. In chemistry, there's a word called entropy that we're not going to get into in this class, but it kind of describes disorder and that the amount of entropy in the universe is always increasing is another way of saying that second law. This is something that could be an application question on the AP exam. There's a rule in ecology called the 10% rule, which basically says that only about 10% of the energy captured at one level in an ecosystem, like here, the producers, only about 10% of that energy gets passed to the next level, and the rest of it, notice, is lost as heat. And so they gave an example here that you start with 20,000 kilocalories of energy per square meter per year, but only about 2,000 kilocalories of energy gets passed to the next level, and only about 200 of that, and only about 20 of that. So, and you could be given a, a math question like this on our test or on the AP exam, where they give you some number here and then ask you how much would be available at one of these other levels. And it's a really easy rule. You just divide by 10 for each level you go up because only 10% of the energy is getting passed on. The other 90% is sort of being converted to heat, which is that unuseful form of energy. All right, in science we also use, in chemistry you were very, you might have used the terms endothermic and exothermic because in chemistry a lot of times the way we measure whether a reaction is using energy or releasing energy or what's going on is we measure temperature changes. The thing is, in our bodies, remember, we kind of maintain a very constant temperature in our cells. We don't have, like, our stomach, for example, at a higher temperature so that our food can get digested. It doesn't work like that. So we don't use the terms endothermic and exothermic. We use endergonic and exergonic. So it's a more general word. Instead of endothermic, which would mean a reaction that requires heat, we use endergonic, a reaction that requires energy because heat's not going to be our energy source. Heat, our energy source in cell reactions is going to be ATP. Whereas in a chemistry lab, yes, in a beaker, you might see a reaction be endothermic and absorb heat from its surroundings, but that's not the way it works in our cells. So exergonic reactions or any reactions that release energy, they typically can occur without inputting energy. They're sometimes called spontaneous reactions, although that gives the implication that they're fast and they may be very slow. And then endergonic reactions require energy. In our cells, these are reactions that wouldn't happen if ATP wasn't available to um, <clears throat> provide the energy for the reaction. And here's a picture. So exergonic, notice free energy, energy available. There's less of it in the products because energy was released. And notice in the endergonic reaction, energy comes in. In the case of um, our cells, ATP, might be the, the provider of that. In photosynthesis, the sunlight is the provider of that. But energy has to go in, and the products end with less, uh, with more free energy than the reactants had in this scenario. All right, and that brings us to something called the activation energy barrier or activation energy. So here's the deal. Even if a reaction is exergonic, you still have to get it started. You all drive around with a car full of gasoline and you're fairly confident your car's not going to explode, even though you know gasoline is full of energy. So why doesn't your gasoline in your car just explode? Because the activation energy, it needs a kickstart to get it started. So if I had a beaker of gasoline on my desk, it could sit there all day. Nothing's going to happen. But if I was to say just heat it a little or put a match to it, that would be the activation energy, that kickstart to get the reaction going. And so exergonic reactions, those that release energy and don't necessarily need energy to get going, um, they may be very slow because of a high E sub A or a high activation energy. It's a kickstart. I shouldn't say they don't need energy to get going. It's like they need a kickstart to get going, but they don't need energy to continue. Like I said, with gasoline, once I light it, if I douse something in gasoline, all I have to do is light this little tiny part and it's gonna go. And I don't have to do anything else. Once it starts, it's going to go to completion. But it needed that kickstart to get started. And that's activation energy. And this is what prevents all the reactions that could happen from all happening immediately. I mean, technically, you would spontaneously combust if it wasn't for activation energy because you have a lot of potential energy in your cells, in, your, in the chemicals in your cells. A pile of ash has way less. 
So why don't you spontaneously combust? Because of this. So here's the reactants. Here's the products. This is the free energy change. Notice energy is released by this reaction. It's favorable. But here's the activation energy. This kickstart to get the reaction going. And this you could think of a ball rolling down a hill. Once the ball gets to here, it's going to go. But it needs that push to get it started. So this is what keeps uh, reactions, all the reactions from happening, or keeps them very slow. Some reactions have very low activation energy. They happen right away. This is why you don't drive around with TNT in the back of your car. That might blow up if you want over a bump. Gasoline, not so much. All right, enzymes. So what enzymes do for us is they speed up reactions by lowering the activation energy. I gave the example of sucrose here. Um, sucrose, table sugar, breaks into glucose and fructose. This is an exergonic reaction. It releases energy. But this might happen really slow. You might have a, a, a thing of sugar in your house, and it could sit there 10 years, and this wouldn't, it wouldn't break down. But if you add in an enzyme, it would break down in just a matter of seconds. Another really good example of this that we're going to be working with in the lab is peroxide. Peroxide breaks down into water and oxygen. And this is a favorable reaction. But you can go buy peroxide at the store and keep it in your house, and three years later, your peroxide pretty much, very little, has broken down. You may feel a little bit like the bottle's a little swollen, so a little bit of oxygen's been made. But if you add catalase, which is the enzyme in your cells, it's also in your, it's in your blood, you see the cut, you put it on a cut, and it bubbles, and it, the peroxide's broken down in seconds. So the enzyme speeds up the reaction. It catalyzes the reaction. So it happens much faster. And this is the graph that you should know. And this, this graph will definitely be on your test. So this is the free energy change. This is free energy. Notice this does not change whether you have an enzyme or not. All the enzyme does is it lowers activation energy. Now you don't need as big of a kickstart to get the reaction going so it can go faster. But the free energy, the amount of energy from the reactants, the difference between the reactants and the products doesn't change. It's sort of like if you were going to come to school. If you drive, you're going to get to school faster than if you walk. But technically, the distance from your house to school doesn't change. Whether you drive or walk, you're going to go the same distance. You're just going to get there faster. So the free energy change is this here. This is unchanged by an enzyme. But what is changed is the activation energy, the energy to get the reaction started. We'll talk more about this later. So what are, what are enzymes? They are proteins and they're catalysts. A catalyst is really anything that speeds up a reaction. I mean, a match can be a catalyst to get something started, but technically a match can only be used once. Enzymes are reusable. They're not consumed by the reaction, but they can be reused over and over and over again. So they speed up reactions without being consumed by them. And the way they work, like I said, is they lower the activation energy. They lower that little hump, that little kickstart, so that the reaction can work at a normal temperature in your body very quickly. And they're very specific. You have thousands of different enzymes, and every enzyme has its own specific job that it does. So uh, some vocab. The thing that the enzyme binds to is called the substrate. And the substrate is going to get turned into product. What's formed when the enzyme and the substrate bind is called the enzyme-substrate complex. And the place where the enzyme binds is called the active site. So this was my enzyme, this was my substrate, and this would be my active site. Now when they bind, they mold together, sort of like this. Notice how my active site and my substrate sort of changed shape. This is called induced fit. The idea that the enzyme and the substrate bind together. Um, there's an old mechanism. They used to call it the lock and key model. If you see that as an option on a test, it's not the answer. It's the wrong answer. Because enzymes are not rigid like a lock fitting a key. It's more like a glove fitting your hand. The glove already has the shape of your hand, kind of, but when you put it on your hand, they sort of mold together into the right shape. And these are the ways that enzymes lower the activation energy. For example, for the, let's say this and this are supposed to react, and they're going to form this. But the only way they're going to react is they have to hit each other just right. Well, one thing an enzyme can do is it can hold them in the position to do that. It can also strain them so it, and it breaks more easily. It can also create a pH in this area or bond to the substrate. These are all ways an enzyme 
can speed up how quickly a reactant turns into product.